Today's scripture comes out of Luke 4 in the first 13, or the first 13 verses. So hear now the word of God. Jesus returned from the Jordan River full of the Holy Spirit and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. There he was tempted for 40 days by the devil. He ate nothing during these days and afterward Jesus was starving. The devil said to him, since you are God's son, command these stones to become a loaf of bread. Jesus replied, it is written, people don't live only by bread. Next, the devil led him to a high place and showed him in a single instant all the kingdoms of the world. The devil said, I will give you this whole domain and the glory of all these kingdoms. It's been entrusted to me and I can give it to anyone I want. Therefore, if you will worship me, it will, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, You will worship the Lord your God and serve only him. The devil brought him into Jerusalem and stood him on the highest point of the temple. He said to him, Since you are God's son, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and they will take you up in their hands so that you won't hit your foot on a stone. Jesus answered, it's been said, don't test the Lord your God. After finishing every temptation, the devil departed from him until the next opportunity. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. we thank you for the gift of your word. And as we think on these things, open our hearts and minds to hear your word to us today. Amen. So today we hit the first full week of Lent. Sundays are not counted in the 40 days of this preparation season because each Sunday is a little Easter. Each Sunday, we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord. The theme of this year's Lent echoes that. It comes from a group called Sanctified Art. And this is a group of artists and pastors who who desire, as they say on their website, to support worshiping communities and integrating art and creativity into their spiritual practices. So we've turned the sanctuary into a little bit of an art gallery with the different pieces of art that are going to be used during this season all on the walls. Uh, it is our hope that you'll take time to kind of soak in every single one of them as we go through this and, and to look at them and to figure out what it means to you and how it speaks to you. We'll also highlight some of these pieces on our social media page and in, in a Lectio Divina during a midweek moments during the season of Lent. Our Lenten theme is t- entitled Full to the Brim, and here's how it's described on their website. The origins of Lent were that one was to leave their old life behind, to fast and prepare to be baptized into a new way of living. In essence, this was a practice of stepping away from corrupt power, scarcity mentality, and empty rituals in order to live a more expansive and full life of faith. And so our Lenten theme, full to the brim, is an invitation into a radically different Lent, into a full life. It's an invitation to be authentically who you are, to counter scarcity and injustice in every turn, to pour out even more grace whenever it is needed. When we allow ourselves to be filled to the brim with God's lavish love, that love spills over. It reaches beyond ourselves. Like water, it rushes and flows, touching everything in its path. If you haven't picked up your Linton packet, which are these manila envelopes over here on the table, please do so. We're asking that one per household is taken. Uh, there's a meditation cards and conversation starters, a devotion, and other tools to kind of help guide us through these, this 40-day journey to the cross and to the, the empty tomb. I hope that you can give in to this Linton season and to be transformed by God's overwhelming love and grace. But we're just starting that journey. This is the first Sunday of Lent. And today, we look at how Jesus fought off temptation. In the Synoptic Gospels, which is uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, immediately after Jesus is baptized, 
he is then off into the wilderness to be tempted. There he fasts for 40 days, hence the 40 days of Lent. And at the end of those 40 days, he's tempted by the devil. He's offered food and power and glory, and he denies them all. He makes sure to say no in order to say yes to give us eternal life with God. Temptation is real and is ever-present. And in a society that wants what it wants immediately, it makes it even more present. We are surrounded by opportunities at all times, and it can feel hopeless in our pursuit to kind of push them away and keep them at bay. This is an ever-growing issue, and I don't think we know the full social and psychological implications of our culture yet because of this. So just let this sit in, set it in your heads. In a LinkedIn article I read this week, it was written in 2019, so it's already just a, a few years old. It stated that the average consumer in the United States saw around 500 ads per day in the 1970s. So when I was born, TV, newspaper, radio, uh, all the signage on billboards, there were all ads that I would see on an average day. In 2019, the article said that's upward to 5,000 ads per day. There's another article I read uh, that was written this year that said uh, the average person sees roughly 4,000 to 10,000 ads a day. My guess is it depends on how much they use their cell phones and social media. So let's just say for the sake of easy math that that the average person sees 5,000 ads a day. What this means is that on average, you will see 1.8 million ads in the course of one year of life. So for those who live on their phone, you're seeing more, probably 3.6 million ads in the course of a year. How is seeing all that advertisement changing our brains and our views in the world? It's scary how we we, we know without realizing how much we actually know. So let me give you, you an example. We're going to play a little game of a logo quiz. I'm going to show you a little tiny piece of a logo on the screens. Not the whole thing. And what I want you to do is, if you recognize it, raise your hand. For those in the sanctuary, you just raise your hand. You don't yell out what it is. All right? So just raise your hand if you know what it is. So let's see this first one. All right, looks like uh, we have some coffee drinkers or at least uh, cups full of sugar drinkers. So what this, go to the next slide. This is Starbucks or St. Arbucks. Yes. Next one. Okay. Da-da-da-da-da. What is it? It's McDonald's. It's the Golden Arches. If I showed you the top two little parts of the M, I think you would have gotten it. But I wanted to, you know, test you a little bit. Still, some people got it immediately. You saw that red and that yellow, you knew exactly what it was. Next one. I hear some whispering going on. All right, that is what? Disney, that's right. You know, the company that owns everything we watch these days. All right, last one. Jonathan's got it. Logan raised his hand immediately. All right, what is that? We may have lost last night, but we still are the regular season ACC champions. All right, so just a little fun. I mean, you got to have fun in March Madness, right? But isn't it crazy that just a small little bit of Starbucks, you could identify that logo by just looking at the top of the woman's head and the crown that you knew from the Disney's little eye dot or McDonald's at the end of their golden arches, that in your mind you knew exactly what that logo is and what it identified. Companies have done a fabulous job letting that sink into our minds, their products and our needs for it. The ones that are best at it are the ones who are doing it without us even realizing it. 
And this is how temptation works best too. Temptation at its core is something that pulls us away from God. When we fall into temptation, when we give into sin, we're moving away from God. It's only a little something to drink as a nightcap. It's only really one website. It's only nine miles over the speed limit. I mean, I'm not doing a full 10. It's only kissing a different person. As we slip into what is tempting, we, we rationalize and we, and we build up excuses that make us feel better about where we end up. But we always end up in the same place each time. We live in a world where nothing is our fault. We watch celebrities and politicians play word, word games to, to wiggle themselves out of being held accountable for their actions. And as we do this, we start to think that if we ever are at fault for doing anything, I mean, temptation is all around us. It's easy. It's just right there. So how can we be held accountable for giving into it? When we give in to temptation, we are truly saying that that object of our desire is more important than living like God desires. As Mark Twain famously said, I deal with temptation by yielding to it. It's funny, but that's how many of us deal with temptation. When we do that, what we're really saying is that something, whatever that something is, is more important than God. Our vision is only about what is right in front of us, and we cannot see the forest through the trees. We know there are some things that we shouldn't be doing. We know that we should cut back on the amount of time we spend on our vices because it really isn't useful to life. For there are others who don't care. And so they light up and drink up and kiss up without thinking what they're doing to their relationships around them and the relationship between them and God. Paul has this great quote. It's a complicated sentence and it's really hard to read, but it's a genius one when we understand. He writes this, and I'm going to take it slow since my mouth is not working very well today. In Romans 7, verses 14 through 20, this is what he writes. We know that the law is spiritual, but I'm made of flesh and blood and I'm sold as a slave to sin. I don't know what I'm doing because I don't do what I want to do. Instead, I do the things I hate. But if I'm doing the things that I don't want to do, I'm agreeing that the law is right. But now I'm not the one who is doing it anymore. Instead, it's sin that lives in me. I know that good doesn't live in me, that is, in my body. The desire to do good is inside me, but I can't do it. I don't do the good that I want to do, but I do the evil that I don't want to do. But if I do the very thing that I don't want to do, then I'm not the one doing it anymore. Instead, it is sin that lives in me that is doing it. This season of Lent is a time of self-reflection. It's a time to probe deep within ourselves and get down to the core of who we are. After 40 days of not eating, it would have been easy for Jesus to turn rocks into warm, soft, wonderful smelling bread. But the result of saying no to temptation was more important than the bread in that moment. It was so easy to be lured by the power that comes with riches. You're famous and you're looked up to because you're rich. But Jesus saw beyond that temptation. To have the ability to tell God what to do, that has been the desire of humanity since humanity was created and been given free will. Adam and Eve told God that they knew better and so they ate the forbidden fruit anyway. Yet Jesus knew he was sent to make right what was made wrong so long ago. If we're able to step back and to look at the big picture, it's easier to put things into perspective. If we had a window that we could look through and see how our choices that we make today would affect the people that we love and ourselves, my guess is that we would make different choices. If we could see the habits we think we're hiding from our children, but they actually know about, and then they grow up to do the same exact thing, would we continue to do them? If you saw 
that the amount that you drink on a regular basis leads to an early death and heartache for your loved ones, would you continue? If you saw the toll that the medications that you can't stop taking does on your body and the people you hurt by putting your need for them in front of, or the need for those meds in front of them, would you continue? If you saw how spending more than you actually make adds so much more pressure to your marriage that eventually you get a divorce, would you be willing to stop? There are consequences to our actions. They happen internally and externally. And temptation can wrap it up in a pretty paper, tie a ribbon and a bow around it, but the reality is it all leads the same path. Moses gave in to temptation, which let his anger get the best of him, and he murdered someone. David let the temptation of a beautiful woman get the best of him, and it led him to an unexpected pregnancy, to the death of that woman's husband, and to the death of the child. Jonah gave in to the temptation, thinking he knew what the people needed instead of God, and that landed him in the belly of a fish for three days. Peter uh, will give in to temptation later on in this season of denial, and Judas, the temptation of telling God what to do. Paul gave in to the temptation of power, and the list goes on and on and on. Temptation hits everyone. And every time we're faced with it, God says, here we go again. There is only one person who has ever stared temptation in the eye and sent it packing. There's only one person who's been able to keep his eye on the prize and not give in to that immediate satisfaction of it all. Jesus understood the fuller life that is offered by following God. As the full to the brim material states, God's promise spills over like the bounty of the first fruits from the ground. Even in the desert, you are called to the riverside to be washed by grace. We are constantly in the desert of temptation. We live there. Here's the good news and the grace that is offered. So does God. God is there rooting us on and to make the right choices and to get, help us see the long view of things. God sees the seeds we plant and the fruit that comes up. God knows our temptations, our vices, and our struggles. God has gone through it all himself in the form of his son, Jesus Christ. God knows. And since God knows, God is amazing because God offers us grace and forgiveness on top of all of that. God sees us stumble through temptation and forgives us for those mistakes. God sees us continue to make the same mistakes, the same cycle over and over again, and continues to forgive us over and over again, hoping each time we'll make a change for the better. We can name corporate logos. And we may be able to see how they affect us, but we can we name the temptations and the sins that grip our soul? It is time for us to be honest with God and with ourselves. It is time to admit that we live in the desert and we have a blind spot for the broader picture. Like the bread and the juice that are on the altar today, we are offered ways to connect with God, to get strength from God, and continue to seek to live as God desires. To do so means that we put God first and find the refreshing stream of grace offered even in the driest of places, even in the desert. And we fill our souls with that living water, full to the brim, in order to give no room for temptation to get a hold. And all God's people said, let us pray. Lord, you know what speaks to our heart and what calls our names. May we silence those calls and listen to the way that you call us to live instead. May the name that you call us, your precious child, your beautiful creation, speak louder than anything else in this world. May we see the long-term implications of what life following you means for us and for those around us. Deliver us from temptation, God. Just as your son defeated the devil today, as he wandered the desert and fasted for 40 days. 
Guide us on this 40-day journey to be molded into your son's likeness. It is in his name we pray. Amen.